Okay, yeah, so I'm going to show you um, some sort of introductory slides initially to network science. Um, it's probably presumptuous of me, but it's a relatively unexplored field, I think, and within F sharp in particular, there hasn't been a lot of work done in this space um, until recently. Um, so within Hack and Craft, we um, build simulations and data science solutions, mostly for logistics and supply chain companies. Um, you can think of a supply chain as a kind of complex system. So a complex system similar to the economy as a whole or the processes in cells. These things are complex systems that exhibit nonlinear behaviors um, that are very hard to understand um, and analyze. One of the tech techniques that can be used to do that is network science, and that starts from the assumption that if you want to understand how a system works, the best thing to do is understand its structure. So Barabashi, who's the sort of main sort of uh, network scientist of the day, came up with a lot of very important discoveries in network science. Um, most importantly, he realized that networks from different domains have very similar structures, so that you can use the same techniques, whether you're analyzing the economy or proteins or cells or social networks or supply chains. So these two uh, visualizations, uh, the one on the left is actually the physical structure of the internet. So these are routers connected and this is the structure of the web. So the pages that run on the routers. So you get some, the other nice thing about network science is you get lots of nice visualizations. So yeah. Supply chains are really interesting because they're essential. Um, everything, that, all, you know, all the stuff that you buy in the supermarket, all the products that we have, all the things that are essential. What's up? Is it not loud enough? Uh, no, no, no. All right, this one. Is it better? Okay. Um, yeah, so everything that you have in the shops, essential supplies, foods, medicines, these arrive where, they, where you need them as a result of very complex systems uh, that, that interlink. Um, one of the projects that we've worked on recently was for a company that runs the largest pallet network in the world. Um, they operate about 80% of all the consumer goods in the UK and the US travel on their pallets. So they effectively run something like a superset of the entire global supply chain. Um, they have about 400 million pallets that they um, send around and we built a simulation that tracks where those pallets go. Um, uh, Evelina's talk quite accurately described some of our experiences over the last 12 months of working with them in terms of um, trying challenges around getting access to data and generating synthetic data. Um, one of the biggest challenges we have is that um, the network is huge. So if you're simulating 400 assets moving around, Eventually, we had about 190 Docker containers running in parallel, and it would you know, take more than 12 hours to run. So we started looking at other techniques we could use to, to analyze these systems, and network science provides a way of doing that. Um, this is actually a depiction. It's built with a library, siteescape.net. Um, I'm going to show you some more of those. Uh, that's actually the pallet network in Chile uh, in South America. Um, and there's some community algorithm that's been run on that as well. Right, so I thought I'd just uh, give you an understanding of where network science comes from. So the sort of earliest example really comes from graph theory. So 1736, you had Euler trying to solve the bridges of Königsberg problem. So essentially that's how do you, so Königsberg was placed at the top. Um, essentially how do you go over every bridge but only once over each bridge. And you can see in the second one, he thought of the bridges as effectively the edges and the land masses that the river uh, divides as the nodes. And then you can represent it as a network or a graph here. And that led to the intuition that you can only have two numbers of nodes with an odd number of edges. Um, otherwise, you would always be crossing the same bridge twice or leaving a bridge uncrossed. Um, so it's a way of coming up what was a very difficult problem of the day that was solved by thinking of these as a, as a graph or a network problem. Um, today, these kind of techniques are applied to much larger graphs. Um, so just some sort of key terms. Um, so degree is the number of edges of a node. Um, you can see at the top there, 
that's 16 nodes. That's a complete graph. So all the nodes are connected to all the other nodes. Recently, that detection of complete graphs was used to identify bot networks in Twitter, as it, the bots tended to all be connected, like the bot farm, all the bots in it would be connected to each other in a complete graph. Um, one of the things you can do with, with these networks is identify shortest paths between them. So with a complete graph, you've got a shortest path of one, because everything's connected to everything else. Um, with a less complete graph, I think the degree here is uh, three. So every node has a degree of three. And actually, the shortest path between any two randomly chosen pairs of nodes is actually quite long. And it scales linearly as the graph gets bigger. And that was the intuition that um, a lot of people brought to things like Facebook. Um, it's a surprise that on Facebook, they've analyzed it, that if you take any two random people on Facebook, the average distance between those people is about 4.7, which is a lot less. So you're kind of you know, 4.7 friends away from Barack Obama or anyone else you can think of, um, which is, was a surprise. The first example of that was an experiment done by Milgram um, in the 60s. He's better known for the prison experiments where he got, the, got people to shock prisoners, which is a bit macabre. But... Um, the letter experiment, he chose, uh, I think he did one or 200 letters, and he sent them out to people with a target. The letter was supposed to arrive at two people in the US, and he sent them out to random people and said, send this to the person you think is most likely to know this person. And then eventually the letters would arrive, and they knew how many people that had posted that letter. So it's effectively a chain letter where you're counting the numbers of times it's been posted. So and. Counter, counterintuitively, again, the um, real social network was, had smaller, shortest paths than people expected. It was 5.2. Um, and at the time, that was a kind of shocking um, discovery that people are much better connected than they, they think. It's often now referred to as like six degrees of separation. It's the sort of cliche to... Um. So those, those random graphs um, that I showed on the previous slide, they have a very high shortest path. So it, um, and it increases linearly. So that it was felt that these don't represent real networks in the world. And as a result of things like the Milgram experiment, um, network scientists um, tried to think of new graph models which, could, which were a better reflection of this small world property that real networks seem to have. So these are a couple of examples. Um, the erdos renyi graph and the Gilbert graph. In a Gilbert graph, you essentially you, you, you create a list of nodes, and then there's a probability of any two nodes being connected. And as the probability of that increases, the graph becomes more dense. And then in a erdos renyi graph, you have a certain number of nodes, and then you just randomly uh, apply a, a fixed number of edges. So there's slightly different ways of building a graph, um, and they have slightly different properties as a result. One of the interesting things about these random graphs is that they're actually used to see, um, in a similar way to you might use a null hypothesis in statistics, you use them to see if, for any real graph, it seems to have properties that couldn't be explained by random occurrence, i.e. they're sufficiently different from what you'd find in a uh, random network. So these were much closer to what we find uh, both in social networks, but also in things like transportation systems, um, Many of you will have traveled by, by uh, airline to get here. Those networks are also have very short, shortest paths for reasons that I'll come on to. Um, so those two, those two random graph generation methods lack one important um, property, and that's uh, one of Barabashi's key findings, which is the scale-free property. And essentially, that is that um, most real networks have hubs. So nodes with a very high degree. And transport systems is a good example of that. So Heathrow Airport, for example, I was trying to think of an a internet influencer that I could put up there, so Mr. Beast, who my children know of. Um, so people with very high degree. And what that does is it creates very short, shortest paths through the networks. Um, but it has other uh, properties which are really relevant to how you might want to design a supply chain. Um, so there's some other networks. A power, power law degree distribution essentially means that if you take the degree of the most connected hub, 
or the second most connected hub, it will be the second most connected hub will be half as connected as the first most if you have a power law distribution with that exponent. And the exponent can change, but it's actually it's scale free because the exponent is maintained at every level of resolution. So as you go down through the distribution, uh, you'll get the same relationship in size between the hubs. This shows that this is a log log plot of the airport degree distribution, and these ones down here, these are the hubs here, down here. So these are like the Heathrow and Frankfurt and places like that. Um, and yeah, so citation networks is a good example, actually. Um, so generally, papers that are more cited tend to be more cited. So you end up, the way that networks tend to grow is a kind of, once the, there's a, uh, an advantage to some of the early nodes, they tend to pick up more and more links. So in just the same way as an academic paper that gets a lot of citations, that in turn will lead to further citations because loads of people are reading it because they've read the previous citations. So that's why you end up with this uh, power law distribution. Um, so that was observed by Barabashi, and he then created what's called the Barabashi-Albert model, which is, has a principle in it called preferential attachment. And this is basically the idea that as the network grows, new nodes will be added to the network, and they will tend to prefer to be attached to nodes with a higher degree, existing nodes with a higher degree than other nodes. So what, then you get this effect where you have, um, as you can see here, the size of the bubble is the degree, you get one or two very large nodes. And that's in contrast to the, um, the other two, the Erdos Renyi and the Gilbert graphs that don't exhibit this feature. Um, you can see the degree axis here, so the uh, sort of darker purple, Erdos Renyi, you can see has far fewer hubs, hardly has any, and these are the hubs of the Barabashi model. And that more closely resembles uh, what real networks um, look like. Um, yeah, and crucially, its supply chains resemble this Barabashi model. So when we're looking at how to analyze supply chains, um, starting with a yeah, synthetic model that closely reflects what most supply chains look like is obviously important. Um, yeah, so supply chains have a uh, this kind of power law distribution. You can see it here. So these are normally distributed degree distributions, these two. And, but over here, the Barabashi model, you can see that there's a long tail of very large uh, nodes, but the vast majority have very few connections. So that's you know, very stark difference. And that tends to happen partly in supply chains, partly for efficiency reasons. So it's easier to have a massive distribution center rather than lots of localized ones. Um, and also just for sort of how things evolve. If you're working in a planning department of a supply chain, the natural thing to do each day is to connect new destinations to ones that are already uh, very resilient, re reliable, um, very large hubs. Um, if you open a new airport, you'll probably want to have a flight to Heathrow if you can. So um, that's why you tend to find uh, in real networks you get this power law distribution. Okay, so the other interesting thing about them, and this is also relevant for supply chains, is the shortest path. So you can see on the left here, actually these two lines are the ones that are sort of squashed down here. Um, and you can see as the number of nodes increases, the average distance of the shortest paths between the nodes scales up linearly. Whereas here, you can see that actually tails off. And the Barabashi graph uh, tends to even off at about four, which is what you find in Facebook. So again, these networks that are scale free tend to be following this kind of hubs based structure. Um, now there's a sort of key problem with this for supply chains. And that is that they are very vulnerable. So as you can imagine, you know, with flight delays, Heathrow goes down, nobody's going anywhere because all the connecting flights are going through there. But the same thing recently with supply chains with the Suez Canal getting blocked. Same thing, it's a hub, and then they just can't pass through. Um, so what, one of the things we do in Hack and Craft is simulate what would happen under different scenarios. So when the supply chain is being disrupted, what would happen? And there's two different kinds of disruptions you can have in supply chains. You can have random attacks, which is basically things like you know, fires, um, things that are not in any way targeted and can happen to any node. Then you have targeted attacks, and one standard way that you model that is you target the degrees with the highest 
sorry, you target the nodes with the highest degree. So you start, you know, by if you're gonna if you want to take down the transportation system, you would start with Heathrow. You know, if you want to um, reduce the amount of traffic in social networks, you would take down the, the influencer accounts first. Um, and these Barabashi models, as a result, are very susceptible to targeted attacks because Barabashi models have hubs, very large degree. If the targeted attacks are attacking the ones with a large degree, the network's going to um, break apart faster. Um, so on the y-axis, you've got the size of the largest component. So components in a network are um, connected subgraphs, if you like. And so generally, a, um, a a graph will generally have a giant component, which is the, um, the largest of the components. And what this shows is um, how the size of the largest component, how it decreases as you take out certain nodes. So gradually, the network gets broken up. So imagine you've got you know, a group of friends over here and a group of friends over here, and there's like a bridge node in the middle. There's one person who knows both groups. You take out that person, you've got two components instead of one. Yeah. So that's modeling here. If you simulate... Uh, disruptions on supply chains of that of those different types. So this is the worst performing one is the Barabashi one, uh, and it shows the random ones generally. You know, they break apart in a kind of linear uh, in, on a linear process. But the targeted attacks on the Barabashi graph will very quickly damage it. And this is of interest to anybody working in supply chain because they're aware that targeted attacks are quite possible, not just things like terrorist attacks, but there's also generally disruption at the largest nodes, all sorts of reasons behind that. So COVID was a good example. Um, Brexit was another example. And there's lots of smaller events that are happening all the time that are disrupting supply chains in this way. So to model a supply chain um, more accurately, you really need to treat it as a heterogeneous network. So everything I've showed you so far has all been done with a library called Graphoscope, which has been built um, in, a, in a collaborative effort with um, Timo and his team. Um, it's under FS Lab. Uh, we use it you know, every day within Hack and Craft. Um, and this is Cytoscape, which has generated this Cytoscape.net, also a project that is uh, uh, quite mature now and uh, is you know, open to contributions from the community. Um, so what this shows is the triangles are the demand nodes and the squares are supply nodes. So you start to have a graph or a network with different types of nodes. And the red demand nodes are ones which don't quite have enough uh, supply. And the, um, uh, the black squares are the ones which um, they have been fully utilized. So you can start to model um, supply networks. And a lot of them actually look like this, where they have a kind of snowflake type uh, approach. Um, so what's interesting is how quickly you can break that apart. Um, generally, within supply chains, people use, so the large, size of the largest component is one thing, but you commonly find in the literature people use what they call supply availability, uh, which is just um, the ratio of nodes that have access to a supply node. So if, if you've got um, 10 demand nodes and five of them have access to a supply node, then you've got a 0.5 supply av availability ratio. So what this shows is this is the size of the largest component, and this is the supply availability uh, visualization. And again, you can see that um, targeted attacks reduce the supply availability very quickly, and the size of the largest component decreases very quickly as well. So these are both uh, measures which are ways of um, analyzing if um, yeah, how, how resilient a given supply chain structure will be under a disruption. Um, so I was going to just, all of the charts that I've shown you, they're all, they've all been produced with Plotly.net. Um, on my GitHub page, there is the code behind all of this. I wasn't um, sure whether to do a live demo of all of this, but um, all of this code is in. Uh, the GitHub. So if you're interested in how you can build networks in F Sharp and how you can simulate various things, uh, all of the things I've shown, shown you are on, on my GitHub page. Um, um, yeah, so I think 
maybe finally I could say, um, one of the things that obviously the, the next question is, well, if you have these common structures behind supply chains, um, what could we do to make them more resilient? And there's interesting ways that that can be done. Um, so is, this chart shows the resilience of different supply chain networks that have been had additional edges added into them. Um, so the first, uh, the first way is we just we add links between demand nodes, um, which that therefore means that if a supply node goes down, the demand nodes can get their supply from each other. So effectively, a demand node you can think of the demand nodes like distribution centers. So by linking the distribution centers, they can retain resilience even if the big supply nodes are being disrupted. And that is the. Uh, yeah, that's the blue line. And then you have the green line where what you do is you link the uh, demand nodes to uh, other nodes that have a very high degree um, so that those demand nodes are served by more than one supply node. So if one of the supply nodes is taken out, the demand node is still being serviced and then can also supply the other child demand nodes that it has. And then finally, the most effective way of maintaining resilience in the network is to uh, connect the uh, demand nodes based on uh, other demand nodes or the other demand nodes that are connected to supply nodes with a low degree. So it's kind of intuitively true that if you're I I suspecting targeted attacks, it actually makes sense to have your demand nodes connected to supply nodes with a very low degree as they're less likely to be targeted. And what uh, interesting consequence of that is that supply chains with a more distributed and localized structure are going to be more resilient than those which are heavily centralized around a few hubs. All right, so these three things are, all of the stuff I've shown you has been built with those, those three libraries, the mature libraries, we use them every day. The stuff we've supplied for the um, pallet company I was talking about, which is running the largest supply chain in the world, a lot of the stuff that we're providing to them was built with these three libraries. Um, one of my hopes out of this conference is that the community will come together around contributing to these libraries to bring them forward, to try and reach a critical mass where they can become more, more mature and fully featured. Um, Graphoscope, which is the um, network library, is not mentioned here. It hasn't got a logo yet because it's quite early stage. But um, you can find that on the FS Lab GitHub page as well. Um, and yeah, that's the link to the, to the code that generated all of the things I've shown. Um, and then lastly, a little plug. Um, we're also hiring. So we have these, these projects are expanding. And so if you're interested in hearing more, um, please you know, send me an email. I'll come and talk to me over the next three days. Thank you very much. Cheers.